Hello and welcome to Daily News Simplified. Here we will take up the news articles from the Hindu Delhi edition and discuss them as per the demands of UPSC Civil Services exam. The topics for today's discussion are listed on your screen. Let us begin our discussion. The first topic of today's discussion is based on this news which featured at page number 12 in the Hindu. It basically talks about refugee influx in Mizoram which raises the security issues in the state. Mizoram faces a complex internal security situation as it grapples with an increasing influx from the neighboring countries like Myanmar and Bangladesh and the presence of refugees has exacerbated resource shortages and the potential for unrest in local population this topic deals with the theme of internal security and it is directly mentioned under general studies paper 3 and in 2019 a question was asked on security challenges of northeast and similarly in 2017 a question was asked regarding insurgency in the northeast region from this slide we get to know that the issue of internal security specifically to northeast region is important and recurring theme in upsc mains exam so in today's discussion we will try to analyze the different aspects of internal security challenge with respect to northeast before moving on to the internal security discussion let us try to have a look at the basics about northeast this region comprises eight states arunachal assam manipur meghalaya mizoram nagaland sikkim and tripura and it is a culturally and ethnically diverse region with having more than 200 ethnic groups which have distinct language dialects and socio cultural identities further almost all its border which is around 5400 km are international border and the states in northeast have a long history of conflict and violence among tribal groups and due to these unique characteristics this region faces a problem of insurgency upsc previously asked many questions on insurgency let us try to understand what the insurgency is it refers to a situation where a group of people within a country or a state rebels against the established government or authority and these individuals or groups use various methods or tactics such as armed attacks or protests to challenge the government's power and influence and the insurgencies often arise due to the grievances related to political social economic or ethnic issues and what is the goal of insurgents it is typically to bring about a political change or gain more control over specific region or population insurgencies can be prolonged and challenging to resolve which often requires complex efforts from both government and insurgents to reach a peaceful resolution before discussing the reasons for insurgency in northeast we want to give you a piece of advice whenever you come across a question related to internal security just try to incorporate these things in your answer firstly you can make a map to show the disputed region government steps regarding that and the measures you can divide the measures in three headings legal institutional and socio economic in this way you will give a better structure to your answer which will help you in fetching more marks for the same content now we will analyze the reasons for insurgency in northeast the first one is ethno nationalism and the lack of integration with nationalistic aspirations and the crux of this issue lies in the isolationist policies of britishers which primarily focuses on the isolation of northeast states from the mainstream national movement the second reason is demand for autonomy various tribal groups in the northeast region are demanding for larger control over political landscape for example naga movement which is demanding for greater nagaland the third is illegal migration there is a change in demography due to immigration from neighboring countries such as bangladesh and myanmar and it is happening due to the porous border which india shares with these neighboring countries further there is a the existence of militant groups such as ulfa 
and NSCN, the National Socialist Council of Nagaland. Another reason is alienation of tribal people due to intrusion by outsiders. And the next is existence of terror camps across the border in Myanmar. And there is also a lack of visionary leadership among the tribal communities and they tend to indulge in illegal activities to meet their demands. Further, there is an instability in the neighboring countries such as Myanmar. Presently, there is a political turmoil and before that, the Rohingya issue. Due to that, many people illegally migrated to Indian side to avoid persecution. Further, the proximity to Golden Triangle as it ensures the funding of separatist secessionist organizations via support to illegal drug smuggling. And lastly, the misuse of AFSPA. Security forces are accused of alleged human rights violation and some innocent people suffer due to that and they tend to involve with insurgent groups. Now we will have a look at the present situation of Northeast insurgency. These data figures have been compiled by Ministry of Home Affairs and it shows that from 2015 to 2021, the incidents has reduced drastically from 574 to 200 and the civilians death has also reduced from 46 to 23. And there is a huge success in this particular section as in 2015 only 143 ex extremists have surrendered and in 2021 this number rose to 1400 and persons kidnapped has also reduced from 267 to 94. This table shows that the overall situation in the northeast region has improved. Now what is the government's response to control the insurgency in northeast? The first one is Hill Area Development Program in Northeast. It basically focuses on infrastructure, both social and physical. It includes hospitals, schools and colleges. And the physical infrastructure includes roads, railways and electricity. The next one is, government has established the Ministry of Development of Northeast Region, which is famously known as Donor, to accelerate the pace of socio-economic development so that all the northeastern states enjoy the growth parity with the rest of the country by focusing on connectivity, capacity building and skill based industry. Government brought out a scheme named PM Divine which focuses on the all round development of northeast region and to make it an economic hub connecting southeast Asia under Act East policy. Further, the entire state of Manipur, Nagaland and Assam are under AFSPA. Central government has also deployed CAPF to aid state authorities for carrying out counter-insurgency operations. And government also focuses on its Act East policy, which focuses on connecting projects and people-to-people -people exchanges, which will increase the livelihood opportunities for people who are living in Northeast region. And there will be less chances that the youth will be motivated to join the insurgent groups. And lastly, the coordination with neighboring countries. And a classic example to this is Operation Sunrise. India and Myanmar coordinated together to target insurgent group camps in Northeast. As we have briefly discussed the government's response, now what can be the way forward or a roadmap to bring prosperity and stability in Northeast? The first one is strengthen intelligence mechanism. We need to enhance the intelligence networks and coordination among different intelligence agencies to improve the information sharing mechanism between center and state agencies. Further, we need to engage the community at all levels and we need to promote dialogue and engagement with local communities to build trust and gather intelligence from them. We also need to encourage the participation of local communities in the decision making process. Thirdly, enhance border security. We can use the new technologies such as drones, smart fencing to enhance the surveillance at border areas where deployment of forces is difficult. Counter-insurgency operations. We need to conduct a well-planned and targeted operations against insurgent groups. Also, there is a domain of legal framework. We need to review and update the existing laws and regulations related to security and counter-insurgency operations. We also need to ensure strict enforcement of laws 
to prevent arms smuggling, human trafficking and illegal activities. And fast track courts can also be established to expedite the legal process and ensure justice to innocent people. Government also need to manage the media. Security forces and administration should collaborate with media organizations to disseminate information on security measures and public safety. Further, there is a need for continuous monitoring and evaluation. We need to build a system for periodic review and to form strategies so that security situation in the region can be improved and necessary adjustments can be made to adapt to evolving security challenges. We also need a regional cooperation to deal with the security situation in northeast region. We need to foster cooperation and intelligence sharing with the neighboring countries, particularly Bangladesh and Myanmar. Further, there is a need to strengthen the diplomatic ties to address the cross-border issues such as insurgent hideouts and safe heavens. Lastly, we need to build capacity among our security forces. Government needs to invest in training and capacity building programs of security forces to handle the modern security challenges effectively. There is a need for specialized training in counter-insurgency tactics, intelligence gathering and human rights awareness. And to conclude, you can write that implementing these measures requires a close coordination among center government, state government, security forces and local communities. It is crucial to address both the security aspect and the underlying socio-economic issues to achieve sustainable peace and stability in the Northeast region. As we have discussed the issue of insurgency in detail, I hope that you will be able to write a decent answer to these questions. A quick recap to our discussion. Firstly, we discussed the context, its relevance for General Studies Paper 3. We also see in the previous year questions, the basics about Northeast, what is insurgency, the reasons for insurgency in Northeast, the present situation, government's response, and a roadmap for stability and prosperity in Northeast. The next topic of today's discussion is based on this news, which featured at page number one in The Hindu. The context is the devastating collision of trains at Balasore in Odisha, which accounts for more than 250 deaths. This topic deals with the safety of railways. And it comes under General Studies Paper 3, in which railways is directly mentioned under the infrastructure section. And in today's discussion, we will try to analyze the different aspects of railway reforms in India. And in 2022, a question was asked on the role of PPP model in the redevelopment of railway stations in India. The recent incident of collision of trains was an unfortunate event in the history of Indian railways. And there is a possibility that a question might appear in the UPSC mains exam. It can be either in the form of railway reforms or a case study regarding the same. Let us have a look at the basics of Indian Railways. Indian Railway possesses the fourth largest railway network globally, spanning around more than 70,000 km. Just keep this fact in mind, as it can be asked in UPSC prelims exam also. Further, it operates approximately 20,000 trains daily, catering to more than 23 million passengers and transporting more than 3 million tons of freight. And the government envisions transforming railways into completely safe, fast and reliable mode of transport for both passengers and freight. Now we will analyze why there is a need for reforms in railways. The first point is related to economic development. Reforms are necessary to align Indian railways with the requirement of rapidly growing 5 trillion economy as it can help the businesses to export and import the goods from different parts of the country. Administrative reforms are required. Simplifying the management of the organization is a crucial task and there is a need to separate the core functions from the known core functions such as medical services, schools and protection forces as recommended by Bibek Dubroy committee. It also suggests establishing a revised governance structure empowered to make decisions independently from government. Further, there is a need for modernization. Indian Railways has lagged in modernizing infrastructure, services and training, which hampers its expansion and efficiency. The outdated practices 
continue to strain the exchequer while providing inefficient services further the aspect of safety the rail accidents in india are alarmingly high as compared to the world average and the kakodkar committee have proposed to invest 1 lakh crore rupees over a period of 5 years and establishing a statutory railway safety authority to address this issue effectively further there is a lack of independent regulator the establishment of statutory railway regulatory authority with an independent budget and detachment from the ministry is recommended although it will not determine tariffs it will ensure that the tariffs are market determined and competitive further there is a need for privatization and the point to be noted here that many of the expert groups have said that indian railways should not be privatized but the participation of private sector in railway projects should be allowed and this move will help to enhance the competition and reduce the costs by outsourcing the non core functions to private entities lastly the financing challenges financing railway poses a challenge due to investment in low traffic projects and imbalanced mix of passenger and freight traffic and the inability to increase revenue through efficiency improvements further the internal resource generation within railways should be improved to address these challenges effectively now we will discuss the initiatives of government in this regard the government has undertaken several initiatives to transform indian railways the first one focusing on dedicated freight corridors which is also called as dfcs these corridors aim to improve the freight traffic and are expected to be completed by 2024 further the western dedicated freight corridor and the eastern dedicated freight corridor have received funding from world bank and japan's corporation agency respectively the second one is pm gati shakti this transformative approach focuses on roads railways ports and logistics infrastructure to drive economic growth and sustainable development further it aims to develop a world class infrastructure for seamless connectivity and efficient movement of goods services and people the next is atmanirbhar bharat abhiyan it aims to promote self reliance and the indian railways is sourcing over 97% of the equipment for electric locomotive production domestically and a classic example to this is vande bharat high speed trains further there is a need to push for safety and in this regard kavach system it is a state of art electronic system that is meant to provide protection by preventing trains from passing the signal and avoid collision it activates the train's braking system automatically if the driver fails to control the train and an added feature in this is a centralized live monitoring of train movements through network monitor system you can quote such examples while writing an answer on railway safety and lastly station infrastructure redevelopment program under this program 400 railway stations will be redeveloped with an investment through public private partnership and the goal is to create self sustainable technologically advanced and passenger friendly stations in conclusion you can write that there is a need to expand the indigenous manufacturing and corporatize its core functions further there should be a focus on revenue generation by prioritizing freight revenue and expediting the operationalization of dfcs will enhance the overall revenue for indian railways and to ensure the progress it is crucial to execute these initiatives promptly and efficiently a quick recap to our discussion firstly we discussed the context its relevance for general studies paper 3 we also seen a previous year question of 2022 mains basics about indian railways why there is a need for reforms and the government initiatives in this particular regard moving on to the next topic which is based on this news which featured at page number 11 in the hindu it basically talks about caste system in india and the context is that in a recently released movie kathal a young woman cop counters an upper caste man stereotype about lower caste people as thieves although the context of this news is not important as far as our upsc exam is concerned but this topic is important under general studies paper 1 in indian society 
and UPSC has previously asked questions related to caste. In 2018, UPSC asked that caste system in India is assuming new identities and associational forms and hence the caste system cannot be eradicated in India. Similarly, in 2020, has the caste lost its relevance in understanding the multicultural Indian society? So, from these questions, we get an idea that caste is an important topic under General Studies Paper 1. In today's discussion, we will try to analyze what is caste and what is the difference between caste and class and the role of caste in politics. Let us try to understand what is caste. The term caste comes from a Portuguese term, casa, which means pure blood. And it is the translation of Indian word jati. And caste system in India is a social stratification which is based on the concept of purity and pollution. Further, it is a hierarchical system in which Brahmins occupy the highest place. Below that, there are Kshatriyas, Vaishyas, Shudras and Dalits occupy the lowest place in this hierarchical ladder. So whenever you come across a question regarding caste, you can start your answer with this introduction. Now we'll see what is the difference between caste and class. Caste is a spiritualistic or a religious concept whereas class is based on economic criteria. Further, caste is based on birth and class is based on achievements. And caste is a closed group and there is no mobility whereas class system is open and it provides mobility to different sections of society. Just try to remember these differences between caste and class. Now we will try to analyze the role of caste in Indian political system through a question which says critically examine the role of caste in Indian politics. First of all, we will try to understand the positive impact of caste. Caste has played a prominent role in political mobilization to address the specific issues like discrimination, manual scavenging and many more. And the interaction between politics and caste has led to the politicization of caste and it has further brought caste and politics nearer to each other. Further, caste has been the basis of political patronage, hence there is a dominant influence of caste in politics, which can be seen predominantly at the elections at panchayat and state legislature level. And the relationship between caste and politics is basically a relationship for specific purpose of organizing a public activity. And it is done to raise the voice of the people who are at disadvantageous position and to increase their representation at the decision-making positions. Further, caste is mobilized for expanding secular benefits like political power, administrative patronage and economic opportunities. And lastly, it can be said that politics has now been caste-ridden and at the same time, caste has been politicized in India. If a question will be asked on politics and caste, then you can mention the positive impact of caste in the Indian political system. Now we will see the negative impact of caste. The role of caste in politics is detrimental to the national unity as it hampers the feeling of brotherhood and will polarize people against each other. And it can also give rise to communalism. When one party mobilizes people on the basis of caste and other party on the basis of religion, it can lead to conflicts in the society. Further, the rise of reverse sensitization under which the dominant caste now demands entitlement of lower castes, for example Marathas, Jats and Kapus, they are demanding to be included under OBC. And it will not only impact the social fabric but also defeat the basic purpose behind the affirmative action which was brought in to provide adequate representation to the different section of society at political, economic, employment and educational level. And finally, we need to balance out the positive and negative aspects of caste system and make appropriate changes to remove the use of caste across different lines in realizing the true ideals of constitutional makers. In this way, you can conclude your answer on role of caste in politics. The last topic of today's discussion is based on this news which featured at page number 14 in The Hindu. The president of the Confederation of Indian Industry believes that there is an opportunity for some quick win reforms to stimulate the economy. He suggests expanding global trade ties 
facilitating investments from pension funds and insurers and addressing the bigger changes like GST rationalization. He further emphasizes the need for Indian businesses to access growth capital more easily from domestic banks and overseas investors. The Prime Minister of India has set a target for 5 trillion economy. Hence, the economic growth and the reforms which are required to stimulate that growth is important for our discussion. This topic is relevant for General Studies Paper 3. In 2022, a question was asked related to economic growth and labor productivity. Hence, the issues associated with the economy and its growth are relevant for UPSC mains exam. Today we will try to analyze what are the challenges which needs to be tackled to become 5 trillion economy and the measures which are required for that. The first challenge is inflation. Although there has been a recovery in the GDP growth after the pandemic, but inflation remained persistently high which posed a challenge to the central bank in balancing economic growth with price stability. And further, high inflation acts as a tax on consumers and deprives them of their savings. And India's gross domestic savings have fallen from 37% in 2010 to around 27% in 2022. And this declining saving rates impact the much needed private investment growth. The second challenge is India is unable to reach its potential GDP. Although India is one of the fastest growing economies in the world, but we have yet to realize our potential GDP. Before discussing these points, let us try to understand what is potential GDP. It refers to real GDP that an economy can produce on sustained basis with current labor force, capital and technology without generating inflationary pressure on prices. The potential output is determined by the size of labor force, the stock of capital and the state of technology. Further, potential output is the economy's output based on full employment of these inputs. Now coming back to our point, why India is not able to achieve its potential GDP? The first reason is suboptimal utilization of its labor because of rigid labor laws and inadequate skills. The second point is inadequate technology adoption by small and medium industries thereby impacting the productivity of manufacturing sector. Further, there is a high capital output ratio. Let us try to understand what is capital to output ratio. It is used as a tool to explain the relationship between the level of investment made in the economy and the consequent increase in GDP. In simple language, it means to what extent our GDP will increase in relation to the investments made in the economy. And this concept expresses the relationship between value of capital invested and the value of output. Further, it is the amount of capital needed to produce one unit of output. For example, suppose that the investment level in the economy is 32% and the economic growth corresponding to this level of investment is 8%. Hence, the capital output ratio is 4, which is 32 divided by 8. And a high capital output ratio indicates that economy is inefficient in its use of capital. And here, the high capital output ratio indicates that the inefficient use of capital and it hinders the Indian economy to reach its potential GDP. The next challenge is less share of exports in GDP. Although the share of overall exports has been increasing since 2017, but the contribution of net exports, which means exports minus imports, to the overall GDP is very low in India and it is due to high logistics cost, high indirect taxes, the volatility of rupee and the underutilization of free trade agreements. Now how these free trade agreements are impacting India's exports? Because of the competitiveness, Indian goods are not able to compete with the products which are coming from the neighboring countries with which we have free trade agreement. For example, ASEAN countries. After signing the agreement with these countries, our trade deficit has widened and due to that the share of exports to Indian GDP has not increased substantially. And the last one is external shocks. In this globalized era, the emerging economies are increasingly at the risk 
due to uncertain policies of advanced economies such as United States which increases the interest rates and other incidents like Russian Ukraine war which invariably impacts our exports and import now we will see the measures which can be adopted to reach the goal of 5 trillion economy the first one is incentivizing the savings we need to incentivize savings among households by rationalizing the income tax slabs increasing the interest rates of small saving schemes and giving tax exemption on them further there is a need to adopt superior technology to increase the efficiency of capital expenditure and to make our goods competitive enough to compete in world market further there should be a provision for industry relevant skills and we also need to liberalize the labor regulations and in this regard government needs to push the implementation of new labor codes expanding the export trade by diversifying to new markets and the review of existing free trade agreements to make it favorable to indian export trade and lastly we need to maintain high foreign exchange reserves and sustain foreign direct investment that will provide a good buffer against external shocks these are the generic points which you can mention if a question appears on indian economy which requires you to write measures to boost the economic growth that's all for today's discussion thank you for watching today's dns stay tuned for upcoming sessions which will enhance your preparation for the mains exam which is going to be conducted in september 2023